are uh, online and uh, physically present in this venue. My name is uh, Dr. Ben uh, Nyarik Nyanchoga. I am going to be the session chair uh, for our series, for this uh, seminar today, in our series of uh, seminars. Uh, this afternoon, we are privileged uh, to have one of our senior academic member of staff uh, from the Department of History and Archaeology, Professor Ephraim Waome. Professor Ephraim Waome uh, is the former immediate dean, uh, faculty of arts and social sciences. He also has served before as the chairperson or chairman of the Department of History and Archaeology. Uh, Professor Waome has published extensively in areas of uh, heritage conservation. And we are privileged uh, to have him this afternoon where he's going to speak to us on a subject entitled uh, Historical Monuments and the Tragedy of the Commons in the Coast of Kenya. Uh, this is indeed going to be a very interesting uh, subject. Uh, and we welcome our speaker uh, to take to the podium to take us through this uh, presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Professor Waomi. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, colleagues. I'm happy to be with you this afternoon. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to be in the department and to present in the department. I have uh, been on tour of duty uh, for some time, but I've never parted ways with the department. I've always tried to come here and I've attended the area uh, workshops. Um, today I'm going to talk on a topic that uh, I have been dealing with for some time. I've been dealing with it for some time and I can see the fruits of part of my research. Today I got a photograph showing that one of the areas that I addressed the issue about has already been fixed. So I'm happy that um, it has uh, had some tangible results. Um, I also want to uh, um, appreciate um, the people we have worked with I have uh, Professor Bernard Mugwema from JKU Art. We have worked with him over a long period of, of, of uh, time. Uh, I also want to uh, appreciate um, Dr. Dominic Kinywa, who is in uh, KU and a colleague for some time. Uh, I also want to thank the NMK, uh, the National Museums of Kenya because I worked on the auspices of the NMK and uh, some of the findings were meant to make NMK more efficient in dealing with heritage. Uh, this study specifically will deal with the, raising the issues that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of conservation. And the study covered the whole of Kenya. I'm only looking at the coast but it covered the whole of Kenya. We looked at every site in Kenya and looked at their challenges. And uh, today I have framed my topic as a uh, historical monuments and the tragedy of the commons. Uh, this topic should be uh, straightforward uh, because I'll be dealing with the monuments um, uh, along the coast. And we are dealing at, as, with monuments as expression of cultural history, as well as diversity and, in, and inclusion, particularly in the Kenya coast, because the monuments we have in Kenya coast are national monuments. They represent inclusion, they represent our history, and that is why they are part of our heritage. When we think about heritage, we are thinking about those things that we link with or we are reminiscent of from the past. Those are what we refer to as heritage. And therefore that is the area that I'll be dealing with. 
But we have observed some few challenges. Um, one of them is climate fluctuation and population structure. And this has been a major challenge, particularly in the coastal areas. The, the populations are increasing I'll, as I'll show. And um, I will also show that um, the environment has been changing quite uh, significantly. I don't want to call it uh, climate change, but I want to call it climatic fluctuations. And those are the two areas that determine whether a particular monument will survive or not. And those are the ones that we identified across the country. As I said, the, the National Museum um, helped me in uh, some of these activities of identifying the sites. I managed to get a boat that took me around to all the sites. And out of that, I was able to get the report that I'm giving you, which was presented to the National Museums a bit earlier, but not in this form, not in the form of a paper. Um, this study identifies the conservation needs of sites which represent a rich history of our past. The paper identifies uh, and samples sites in each of the categories and and for each site identifies the conservation challenges and issues and recommends mitigation strategies as ways of enhancing their sustainability. Uh, this study is part of a nationwide exploration, as I said, of such monuments throughout the country. Um, <clears throat> Urban monuments are subject to uh, processes of transformation that are manifested in their physical forms and functional uses. Physical forms, because monuments, when we talk about monuments, we are talking of structures that are outside, that cannot be brought into a museum. Those are what we refer to as monuments. Like here in Nairobi, we have, um, we have the monument of Tomboya. We have the monument of Kimathi and at, um, at um, KICC, we have Kenyatta there. So those are the ones I'm referring to. And therefore the functional use may change because of its, its interference with the, its, its, uh, its, its use in the public domain. And it may also change because of the physical forms that it encounters. Uh, coastal landscape is part of an urban environment undergoing uh, many physical uh, and uh, environmental and social challenges, being subject of fluctuations and social structure and complexity. Um, the Kenyan coast landscape, coastal landscape of his, is of historical significance and uh, it's here referred to as coastal monument in the sense that the whole area captures a number of monuments to an appoint, a point that it becomes an environment that is called coastal monument. Um, this is, this is uh, my own term, but ideally it captures monuments and the, the whole environment becomes like a, like a, a monumental environment. Uh, heritage, the heritage significant has uh, been described by somebody called Torre in 2012 as the total monuments value, um, which ultimately measures the sustainable significance of the monument that has been identified and their conservation needs. <coughs> Sorry, and their, their, their um, needs. Uh, this conservation may follow into two uh, forms. One is preventive where you make the environment ideal for that particular monument. It does ensure that the monument is comfortable where it is. And that preventive can involve uh, just making sure that people do not interfere with it, which is very difficult. The second one is what we call interventive. And the interventive is uh, a case where you renovate the monument because it has stayed for a long time. Those are historical and they have stayed for many years, sometimes up to 700 years for most of the ones along the coast. So because of that, there is need for intervention. There may be need for intervention. The paper theorizes that the significance 
And the meaning of monuments are given by people who interact with them as stakeholders. Stakeholders here is given a, a meaning of the people who stay with the monument, that is the community living with that particular monument, and the people who interact with it at the level of management. Some may be stakeholders at uh, a higher level than others. So we have secondary and primary stakeholders. But here I'm talking of stakeholders in general, because the theory that I'm using here uses that stakeholder. Uh, when, when, when values of a monument get affected, the stakeholder's perception of that value gets altered. Hence, the need for conservation and continuous maintenance. It is therefore important that stakeholders' opinion are considered, considered in safeguarding the values of a historical object through time. This viewpoint is supported by contemporary theory of conservation, which underpins the study. Incidentally, most of the conserved monuments were identified with ritual consultation, and this gives us some problems because uh, mostly they were identified by um, uh, conservators over time, anthropologists, historians, archeologists over time and uh, the local communities were not consulted. So this particular um, contemporary theory of conservation will be important in unraveling some of the challenges that we are facing currently. Um, <clears throat> this study was highly dependent on stakeholders at all levels. And we consulted uh, um, many of those stakeholders. We consulted museum staff at every stage, and we also consulted the community. And that was important in determining uh, what should be done to particular monuments that have been there, either as um, complete monuments, that is buildings, or as, uh, as remnants of those buildings. Uh, this notwithstanding, there was a big place for science in every stage uh, of conservation. And this is what was, the orig was originally used, scientific reasoning, that this has certain scientific characteristics, it needs to be conserved. And that is what is being challenged today, not by myself, but by the communities where those conservations took place. Uh, monuments have been defined as outdoor artistic, landscape, historical or, or scientific uh, objects of value. The value is attached to them because of what they contribute to the society. <clears throat> they include, <clears throat> they, they, they are covered, sorry, by the National Museums and Heritage Act. There's a whole section on monuments and it gives details of what particularly constitutes a monument. Uh, we have the Antiquities and Monuments Act of, of 1983. We have the Constitution of Kenya. The Constitution of Kenya clearly defines what is a monument and uh, what, is, what is not, and has indicated that monuments should be managed by the government and all other artifacts should be managed by museums. The challenge with that is that um, we have never agreed up to today on, on how that can, the modalities, and I'm going to come to that later. Then there is uh, the Bura pro Protocol, which helps us to understand how monuments can be cons conserved. And it is also a legal structure or a, a policy on conservation of heritage in Africa. Then there is UNESCO. And UNESCO has done its uh, work, particularly in defining the, the different forms of heritage. One form of heritage is what we call um, intangible and tangible. Those are the two, tangible and intangible heritage. Tangible heritage is anything, of course, in a very simplistic way that you can touch. Intangible is that which you cannot, and it's of, of historical and scientific value. For example, belief systems. So those cannot be touched. So they are defined by UNESCO in 1995. And um, 
uh, the, 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 the listing of heritage sometimes follows those lines. Now, <clears throat> heritage includes architectural works. Architectural works here like, uh, like buildings. The buildings we have like Old Town Mombasa, Old Town um, Lamu. Those are buildings that are part of what we call monuments. It can be landscapes, that is areas that are of historical significance. It can be cave dwellings, cave paintings, archaeological uh, sites um, that, that have been preserved within the site, anthropological features that have been identified by communities. And all those must have what I said, artistic, historical, or scientific significance. But the range of values may, may increase if the community is actually involved. Because communities have other values that uh, may not be captured by scientists. And this is where now the diversity comes in. Uh, the tragedy of the commons um, is part of the title. And when we talk about the tragedy of the commons, it was uh, a theory that was developed um, in um, UK by William Laird in, 19, in 1833, and it was meant purely for economists. And it was meant to explain that whenever you have a space allocated to the public, which is not controlled, you expect that uh, space to be abused, or you expect an unfairness in the distribution of that particular resource. We know that from forests. If you allow people to enter forests, and I think that that is an issue today, if you tell people go farm in the forest, there are some who will go and cut trees. So that is what this uh, was particularly meant for. But it was later uh, converted to um, uh, to history or historical conservation or historical resources when it was applied by somebody called Garrett Hardin. And he, he looked at outdoor monuments and realized that there are people who take advantage of outdoor monuments in different forms. One is there will be people, because it is outdoor and oftentimes it has unlimited access there are people who will go there and do graffitis. There are people who will go there and chip some of the materials for themselves. And we have seen all those happening in uh, the monuments that we have today. And this is the biggest challenge that the museum was having at that time when this, I, I conducted this research. <clears throat> um, so, the theory on historical resources, especially monuments that are normally outdoor and very strictly control, controlled in terms of access and utilization. And sometimes um, it also affects those have, that have limited control. And that happens with some of the monuments that are at the museum with very limited control because of sometimes because of limitations in terms of capitation. This study is uses the historical resources angle of conservation of monuments, taking cognizance of the fact that they are outdoor heritage and well exposed to the vagaries of nature and the natural use as a common, and natural use as a common, as a common. So common is that particular object. The best examples being, uh, as I say, Tomboya Monument. At one point, the Kogaro came to Tomboya Monument to celebrate their win. And in the process, destroyed the thing. And we had to be coding to, to reconstruct the monument. And this was a big public embarrassment because it is outside the National Archives. I think you have seen it. So, that, that can happen any time where a monument is destroyed because of certain social activities. Um, the study area, the monument that the study found along um, the coastal landscape, the landscape em embraces dynamic, multifaceted and cos cosmopolitan combination of urban dwellings and Swahili 
rural societies. The coastal borders the Indian Ocean to the, to the east and has a coastline stretching from Kiunga uh, to Vanga. Vanga is at the border with, the, um, with Tanzania and Kiunga is at the border with, the, with the Somalia. In the, in the, uh, sorry, Kiunga is in the south. And this is about 574 kilometers. And this is the area that we concentrated on. Um, now, the stretch has been important um, uh, in terms of trade, historical trade, and it has been also an important in the emergence of Swahili city states or emergence or evolution of Swahili city states over time. Now, these city states um, were part of uh, uh, an international market where people from different parts of the world would get commodities from this particular market and they, they and it benefited both the coastline, the interior and the outside world. And because of that, it has lots of elements or symbolism in terms of the history and transformation of the East African coast. Some of the factors that lead to uh, this configuration of some of the monuments include population and climate population change and climate fluctuations. Um, let's, let's look at pop, uh, population fluctuations in the coastal area. Some of the issues that we have with coast, uh, fluctuations is um, that there has been instability in terms of population in the coast there has been a significant increase of population, particularly for the last 20 years. Uh, the coastal population has been increasing by 1 million people every year. And that is a big population. Um, and uh, that is about 30 to 34% from 1999 up to the present. Um, actually not, yeah, from 1990, from, Sorry, from, two, from 1999 up to the present, there has been an increase of either 30 to 34% of the population in the coast. Uh, uh, this is con con contrasted with 14% growth rate between 1989 and 1999. So it is, it is more applying within the last 20 years. And this means that more people than the people who are probably um, at, uh, at this particular environment where conservation was taking place are there today. Um, for an island like Lamu, there has been an, an increase of 42% specifically. That is between 2009 and 2019 and 40% between uh, 1999 and 2009. So that is also a significantly high uh, population increase. And this is drawn from caps. This had implication for urbanization and the space needs, which had an, had an impact on sites like Mnarani site. Mnarani site is threatened with uh, with increasing land grabbing. So there are people who are looking for that land to grab. And it has become very complicated because this site does not have a title. And this is a case that we have been dealing with over the years. We have also seen that Lamu, um, that the Kaya, the Kaya sacred forests have also been increasingly threatened. It is a world heritage site uh, listed by UNESCO, but it has been increasingly threatened by population growth and exploitation of resources there. The Kaya is a forest, and this is a forest that is supposed to be secret, but somehow the, 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 the elders have lost control because of the more youthful generation with the growth. They have also, the youthful generation and the population around are looking for resources for house construction. So this means the Kaya 
has been threatened over a period of time, and this is a problem that we have been grappling with. Uh, that is for Chaco, for Tiba, for Dweri, all those are challenges that have affected it. I know Ukunda, Ukunda might be resting on a Kaya site. Actually, Ukunda is resting on a Kaya site, and you can see that's a whole city. So it has systematically been eaten up. Kaya's, Kaya, 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 Kaya sacred forests have been eaten up by this kind of uh, um, increase in population and demand for resources. The other aspect that uh, has had an impact on uh, conservation is tourism. And what you know is that tourism has been a major source of income for heritage sites. And about 30% of all the visitors that come to Kenya are expected to visit the museum. I think that is our calculation. And it is also supported globally. Now, those, those visit our monuments and visit our museums. And all tourists visiting the country are expected to be motivated or attracted. When we say motivated, we mean they are coming here specifically for the monuments. When we say attracted, they may not be coming here for the monument specifically. So given that 30% will always come to a monument, the reduction in tourism has had an impact. Uh, we have had a, a, a reduction in tourism in a number of times. One is during the 2007-2008 post-election violence. That led to a period within which uh, tourists avoided Kenya for a period. And every election year, I think we, we lose more and more of those tourists. And communities that live with the monuments do get affected by this. And some of the actions that they take in, in conserving the monuments is affected by the fact that uh, the tourists are not coming anymore. We also know that there has been warnings from the West on some areas, like Lamu is a key area in this stretch, but you get warnings that make it impossible for tourists to go there. And for the community, that means that the resources they used to draw from the monuments are not there anymore. It is the same with the terrorism. I think if you go to Kilifi, um, ter uh, tourism has literally died. But the same would be said of uh, Lamu, particularly because of the kidnap of the tourists. Um, that is the, the, the in Kiwayu, the Judas Tebut and uh, the killing of David Tebut. Those are the tourists who are affected. And this has had an impact on tourism in Lamu, not only the city itself, not only the old town itself, but the interior as well. And this impacts the conservator who expects some, some visitation and benefits accruing from tourism. The impact of these episodes had a negative, or negative um, on heritage, leading to disillusionment uh, for heritage stakeholders and especially local communities that benefited from it. The museum has also lost an important part of capitation because the museum also depended on this capitation. And this has meant that it, is, it has been crippled in some of the services. Um, and for the government, I think the government, as we all know, being uh, in this university, the government has reduced com com uh, uh, capitation for most of the government bodies. And I hear the museum is one of it, of them. And it only gives the recurrent expenditure. It only deals with the current expenditure. That is what the salaries and what you need immediately for use. And the funds that are supposed to take care of heritage normally come from tourism activities. So this therefore means that uh, development funds are not provided by the government. And those development funds have been limited because of reduction in tourism over those years that I've talked about. The third one is climatic fluctuation. Now, according to the Coast Research Journal of 2012,
the sea level is expected to rise from 0, 0.0 meters in 1900 as the starting point to about 14 meters in 2100. Um, these are projections. They may never be, uh, become true, but there are signs that uh, there has been some fluctuations in the coast for one. Uh, globally, there is a, a, a rise in uh, sea level of 0 0.86 degree, uh, very, uh, sorry, uh, a global temperature rise of 0 0.86 degrees centigrade between 1980 and 2012, which was recorded by the ICC, which impacts sea level, sea level rise through ice melting. So, this is expected to be a global issue, but specifically for Mombasa, uh, there was a rise, sea level, a rise in sea level between 1986 and 2002. Uh, that is the period when research was done using a permanent point in the sea level service, which indicates that um, there is a systematic increase in sea level. And this does not affect Mombasa only, it affects many parts of the world. We have also seen closer home that, uh, <clears throat> we have also seen that the lakes, our lakes, Lake uh, Naivasha, Lake Nakuru and others are also rising, and Lake Victoria and displacing populations around. So all these signs add up to the possibility of fluctuations that may have an impact on the monuments which are located on the coast. And we have seen that. <clears throat> it is a clear indication that continued, um, um, these, these factors are con uh, clear indications of continued conservation for monuments um, is challenged and requires extra effort to remain afloat. And the task has become more expensive, particularly managing those particular monuments. Uh, the museum conservators have to remain pro proactive in dealing with climatic fluctuations uh, accompanied by floods and strong winds. Uh, sub, um, uh, sub service damage has been more severe and we have particular sites that have had more problems with flooding that has affected the foundations. And this is the most difficult part of our conservation, that sites are wearing out from the foundation. Um, the in situ investigation, the, the, study, the study methods that were used include in situ in investigation involving a longitudinal research. That is, we observed this over a long period of, of, of time, whereby data was gathered from the same subjects repeatedly over a long period of time. In situ virtual observation of, of subjects and the interviews were conducted. That is at the site where these problems are occurring. The interviews involved the management, uh, the management of those particular monuments, curators who are dealing with them on day to day, support staff and other stakeholders, including the communities within which those monuments are located. Uh, photography from the past and present was also uh, considered as archival records so that you can see the monument today and the monument uh, we had up to about uh, uh, 1800s. So you can see the monument from that period up to the present. <clears throat> Philosophically, conservation um, denotes to keep in a certain order, and it was it is um, it it involves direct uh, some certain actions and policies. It is more about in this particular case we are looking at policies in order to maintain the significance of cultural built environment in terms of their symbolic value to the communities. Icomos. Uh, describes uh, uh, conservation as consisting of all the processes of safeguarding a place in order to preserve its cultural significance. 
And uh, we have used this ICOMOS and Burashata in defining the conservation processes that we are dealing with. Uh, the rationale for conservation of monuments is simple, that, that uh, monuments that are within the territory of Kenya are part of our heritage, irrespective of who, who brought them in the country. And uh, we have been conserving both local, international, and any, any monument that is found within our territory. This is because the monuments in the coast of Kenya form a continuous historical landscape uh, extending over a wide space. The approach embraces the interrelationship inter between their physical elements, spatial configuration, and the hierarchy, and as well as natural, uh, natural components and context. Uh, they are cultural value, economic value, and social values. Research Research and practice demonstrate the role played by urban monuments in enhancing significance and sustainability. Globally, conservation has been recognized as a significant public policy um, as it progressively expands from architectural scale of a sole monument building to a set or to a large territory. And this was also considered in this study that we did not see a monument as a single monument, but an extension and interrelationship between them. We use the theory of conservation and uh, the, the, the theory of conservation is the one that uh, was developed by Munoz Vitas and the contemporary theory explains conservation as, as um, a process of uh, preserving and restoring materials, which I had mentioned earlier. But more importantly, he spreads um, uh, preservation into direct preservation activities and activities of environmental preservation. And this is what, what brings in the issue of population and the issue of environment. The theory explains that direct preservation activities are variations in the object and the time limited activities. And the environmental preservation activities refer to variations in the environment in which the object is established and to activities with no limitation of time. Further, restoration refers to deliberate activities of, of observable changes that can be uh, impacted on the heritage. Ideally, there is a limit on how much you can do in terms of uh, renovation of a monument. The focus does is not only on objects themselves, but also concern of the surroundings. In this scenario, conservation is recognized as a constant correlation between objects and subjects, whether involved or not all affected. The importance of an, an object of interest to conservation is given depending on its relevance to the significant number of population. Now, this is something that has never been done before because ideally our conservation has always been uh, specific to the scientific needs, as I said earlier. But they, for this particular theory, it requires that the communities are also involved in conservation. Um, this view goes against the sole mandate of heritage experts holding, holding full responsibility in, um, holding sole responsibility in conservation. It is not an expert only responsibility. It acknowledges that there will be meanings in contributions in this, universe, in this uh, conservation and is therefore an action of conserving uh, values that are relevant to the society. The theory claims that the minimum inter, inter, intervention is a possible goal, but the reversibility is an impossibility. You cannot reverse the conservation of an object. The sites that were considered, as I said, are along this particular stretch, 
And I'll mention some that have been affected by the issues that I have raised. Open, I'm on time. Um, uh, Fort Jesus is one of the site and was built to protect the Portuguese trade, uh, sea trade along the East African coast. Um, the, the site has remained stable since, uh, since construction and it has been an archival heritage since 1908 with, with a lot of stability. Very little has impacted this particular site. And because of that, it has been treated as a stable site. Uh, the original state of the coastline has remained stable up to that time. But in 2016, we have a cliff front uh, collapsing. We had part of it collapsing in 2016. And this was, a, was a, a sign of threat to the heritage. This came from um, many possible sources, but we have zeroed in, um, we have zeroed in on, um, on flooding, uh, island flooding. And because of the poor drainage, part of that water had seeped, seeped underground and the cliff of, of uh, for Jesus had fallen off. Now, when it did this, uh, UNESCO came in and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, uh, it was renovated. And that was a sign that there were deeper problems. And that is when we started looking at uh, what is happening below the surface of uh, for Jesus. And what has been happening is that uh, due to changing climate, there has been a lot of erosion of the coastline, uh, systematic erosion. Some of that is not physical. You cannot see it because it is happening under the, the, the Fort Jesus site. And uh, this was because of a combination of global warming and the waves, change in wave patterns. And uh, this has been happening since 1910. We have seen a lot of wave action, even the lakes and everything else was from about that period. Um, uh, we continued dealing with this particular issue and identified a crack in inside Fort Jesus. And uh, the first action here was that uh, it needed to be stabilized. And this is where our problem started, stabilization because this would have been for the first stabilization process. Um, the issues with this are, one, it would interfere with the coastline. And this is a major challenge. And this is because, as I said, you are dealing with a common and everybody has a say. We did the stakeholders consultation and everything, but this problem uh, remained outstanding until there was some agreement between all the stakeholders for it to be stabilized. But the other issues with the commons is that there are many stakeholders of different form, of different forms. One were the biologists that we were working with. Uh, they felt that doing this will interfere with the ecosystem of, of sea life. But most importantly, what I'm trying to say here is that the environment is a major factor and a factor to be factored in in future. Fort Jesus has been stabilized as you have seen. Uh, there is a small front uh, at Fort Jesus. It's still going on, it's work in progress, but that was important. And this shows you the impact of the, the environment. This was probably caused by service floods in the island that is the service creep. And this was followed by further investigation that I just talked about. Then we went to Jubalam Tuana, the second site. Uh, Jubalam Tuana is uh, in Kilifi. And uh, it contains a house that has the great mosque uh, and, and a number of other areas like uh, areas that are referred to as the mini pools, the house of the kitchen and so on. It is an amalgam of uh, a site. But the issue here with this particular site was that 
the building, the, 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 the monument has been affected by flooding. There is very, there has been very constant flooding in that particular site. And the walls have tilted in one direction away from the sea. And we did investigation on this one. And uh, uh, we realized that uh, the site had been washed away by floods on one side. And it has been uh, because of floods uh, from about 2018, 2016, 2018, uh, the, the walls had tilted and the foundation has been, had been impacted. The implication was that there had been progressive uh, crystallization of salts after floods. So salt enters the features of the site, the building, and it then crystallizes and then it expands. And that was the problem that we were facing. Uh, Jubala Mtwana wall, uh, immediate, immediately, coast, um, uh, immediately bordering the coastline has, is, has also been ripped by raging storms, hence the need for a seawall. So we, we suggested that a seawall should be constructed for this particular site. And this would help with stabilization. Then there is another site called Levin, Levin House. Uh, this house is the same house that was, uh, this house was, was uh, occupied by the Mazului and it was involved in, sl in slave trade. It was a slave trade port. And uh, it, it is located on, at the old port. Um, this particular house was also ripped off by the ocean. And the reason was very high, very, very high tides and uh, very strong waves. It removed the, the staircase to the ocean on the back of this particular house. And uh, this was another sign that global fluctuation, which could be equivalent to global warming, was taking over our sites. Uh, the Revan house has not been stabilized. And it is a big problem because now you cannot, it cannot function. So one of the symbolic values of this was, it was being used to take slaves out. It was being used to get, the, 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 there was a tunnel that, that was helping to access the ocean and that has been blocked. Then we went to Fasco da Gama Pillar and it is a, call, it is a coral pillar in Malindi, Kilifi County. The Fasco da Gama Pillar experienced, ex, experienced major cracks which almost ripped uh, it through the center and it's supporting coral rag, having been systematically fragmented by ferocity of the sea. A set of concrete blocks placed in the perimeter. There were blocks that were placed in the perimeter of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, this monument in order to break the sea waves had already been submerged by the sea. And that meant that it was concert, constantly being battered. And uh, uh, this, this, the, this particular opening was widening with every, every year, it was widening and it was a very big threat. Now I'm getting good news that it has, it has, been, uh, it has been completed, it has been uh, stabilized. And this is very important because it was one of our suggestions. I got a photograph from uh, Norman today that it has been stabilized. I wanted to show you the photograph, but it came a bit late. Uh, finally, we have a site called Shanga. And Shanga is located in, uh, in, uh, in, in Faza. Uh, the, the, that is in the Lamu archipelago. We have uh, Lamu Airad, we have Manda, and we have uh, we have another, uh, a, a, a third site that I'm talking, uh, a, a third island. No, ta, huh? no it's not, ta, it's um, Siu, no, not Siu. Well, let me call it faster because that is where the site is located. Um, now, this particular site is affected by continued fragmentation of its, its perimeter wall. And uh, this has happened because of a bit of neglect. This site is managed from Mobasa 
and the Lamu Island. That is where the curators come from to see this, uh, to, to manage this particular site. But because of uh, vegetation growth, because of um, trees and root rates interfering with the foundation, the site is going through fragmentation. But that was not the main problem. The main problem was the, the population of this island were also using the, the, the coral stones to build their own houses. And this becomes the major challenge that we have. And this is why I have mentioned tourism and mentioned population growth. As the population expands, every space is being utilized. That site is 37 acres in size, but most of these materials are being plucked from the, from the mosques. They are being, the ancient mosques, they are being plucked from Nabahani house. They are being plucked from um, uh, Shanga site. And therefore we have a situation where there is extensive exploitation of those that seven acres. Um, the problem with this is that uh, we don't have a stable museum in this particular area. And we have suggested to the county government that a museum be built in this particular area as part of conservation of this particular site. I'm, I'm saying with all those that there is a threat to heritage in this particular, in, in the coast region. I also want to say that we don't have very effective methods of identifying, uh, the, the museum does not have very effective methods of identifying some of those problems. And I am suggesting that um, there is need for consideration. I'm also looking at Lapset. Lapset, Lapset offices will be in Pate Island. The offices will be in that island where the monuments are being exploited. It will be in Manda where we have a similar problem. And uh, those two islands, uh, the, actually, it will be using the Mada Channel, which is an open, uh, the, it, will, it will be using the open sea between Manda and Pate Island. So that will mean that in future, those areas will be highly compromised because of an increase in population. And I'm suggesting that a museum be built there. We are working with the county government. We work with the former county government so that a museum is done. And I'm looking at the constitution because the constitution says, Museums belong to the county and monuments belong to the museum, uh, to, to the national government. And this would bring uh, some kind of uh, harmony in management of museums. I want to give my recommendations as I close. Protecting the monuments require mitigation measures, which include the following. The service runoff needs to be controlled through proper storm management and the planning in urban areas like Mombasa. Some um, of these strategies need to be championed also by the museum so that the museum works with Mombasa and NEMA to uh, ensure that uh, proper drainage is provided. The local environment and its resources ought to be managed appropriately through local community project initiative that we need to arm the communities. The problem is communities may stay and watch because they have never, they have not been part of the process. They should also benefit from the, they should also benefit from the museums. I'm also saying that there is need to control uh, vegetative growth and the total eradication of vandalism, which is a big problem in the sites in, uh, of the monuments that we have been uh, trying to conserve. Uh, Locally sustainable uh, conservation approaches should be considered for this. And uh, I'm also suggesting that uh, the museum should use integrated techniques of monument surveying, which should help it to, to do, uh, to determine uh, uh, some of the challenges early enough for mitigation. For example, they should be using ground penetrating RANDA, EPR, which maps the sites and it shows some of the challenges that a site may be having. In the case of coastal heritage researches, GPR survey would suffice. Uh, photo, photogrammetry and remote, sen uh, and remote senses, sensing utilizes aerial photography or satellite imaging 
to map large areas and these areas should be exposed to this. And the techniques should be deployed from time to time because of the problems that have been identified. In conclusion, on the basis of reviews of existing literature on climate change, empirical studies on coastal monuments and theoretical foundations, this study builds on a strong relationship between climate fluctuation, human actions, and the state of coastal monuments to, to provide a guidelines on conservation of the monuments and particularly the monuments as commons. Therefore, bold and drastic, and drastic uh, conservation strategies have to be destroyed, have to be employed locally in order to control monument deterioration. Um, more research on relationships between monuments and climate fluctuation need to be done uh, from a highly professional uh, perspective. This would enhance establishment of possible measures to safeguard uh, monuments for posterity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Waome, for giving us a very elaborate uh, presentation on uh, the topic uh, the, uh, conservation of monuments and, of course, the project of the commons. Uh, from this presentation, I, we have learned you know, a few insights that perhaps will uh, chart the way uh, forward on how we can uh, react uh, to what Professor has presented to us this afternoon. And I want to uh, believe that uh, our online uh, audience are there because uh, I'm not seeing uh, any of that in the, in the screen. I cannot be able to charge whether they are in or out, but uh, perhaps uh, let me, we'll know in a few minutes. Uh, from this presentation, colleagues, uh, we learn a few things. Uh, Professor Waome uh, tells us this afternoon that uh, his study was intended uh, to cover the whole of Kenya but uh, focus was given to the coastal area. I think that is what comes out very clearly. Uh, he has been very, very clear that uh, monuments are actually a part of our heritage. Uh, and this heritage can be defined in specific and general terms. And the heritage that he talks about, uh, you know, have some attachment or are the heritage we talk about all monuments are attached to certain values. Uh, number three, Professor puts it very clearly again that conservation of this heritage is key for our history. Indeed, he continues and tells us that uh, climatic and anthropogenic factors affect conservation of monuments and it brings in the aspect of tourism and the effect that it has. Number five, from what I got at, is that museums are the custodians of national monuments, but debates are ongoing as to whether monuments would be managed by government and artifacts would be left to be managed by museums. If my memory serves me well, uh, in accordance to what he said. From what he has presented, he does say that uh, the whole of coastal Kenya can actually be termed as a historical monument. It can be seen as a monument. And therefore, because of that, the museum should deal with the effects of local warming. Museums, or the museum is indeed the custodian 
of our monuments. Finally, I gather this, that conservation of monuments takes many forms, depending on policies that govern national and international you know, uh, monuments. It is time now, uh, colleagues, uh, that we react to the presentation that has been given by Professor Waome. So we take the first, uh, you know, uh, priority to the on-site audience. And I would like to give this chance to any members who are present in here to ask a question, make a comment, or give complimentary, uh, uh, yes, uh, I can see there is a hand from uh, uh, Dr. Kenneth Umbongi, who is our chairman of the department. Uh, Kenneth, you are welcome. Ask your question, make a comment to the is presentation. It on? Yeah. Uh, okay, so should I stand or something? I understand, no problem. Yeah. Um, th thank you, Prof. Uh, for such uh, an eye-opening presentation. Uh, I am generally very ignorant on things conservation, uh, leave alone uh, dealing with monuments as um, uh, 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 structural edifices. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I have learned quite a bit today. And, and, and thank you, Prof. And I want to join uh, the, the, the coordinator of today's program uh, to welcome you back you. after your very successful uh, tour of duty as the dean of uh, the largest faculty the University of Nairobi. And, and, and welcome back uh, to the department. Uh, uh, now in my capacity as the, the chair of the department and, and, and a member of faculty. Now, Prof, um, I, I have three uh, 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 questions in, and, and uh, uh, this is probably that express my ignorance, so please educate me. Uh, one, uh, I, I uh, look at uh, monuments uh, and their representation that needs to be renovated, to, to be plastered, and if that's what happens, uh, that's a layman talking now. Uh, and, um, you, you, you know, look at them vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the, the social context in which they uh, exist. And uh, my question then is, uh, how does um, uh, the, the changing notion of uh, 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 monuments or changing notions of uh, monuments, statues, and and, and all these uh, uh, structures that we have inherited from our history. Uh, on the work of uh, uh, what is now called globally, um, Rods Must Fall uh, movement. In South Africa, uh, and then moved very quickly to Oxford in the UK. And, and we saw a few structures being pulled down uh, particularly of Cecil Roads and uh, uh, in a few countries, I think in Africa, they pulled down uh, the structure of the legendary uh, Mahatma Gandhi and, 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 and all those. Uh, uh, how uh, does these changing notions uh, about the significance of um, uh, uh, these monuments uh, affect their existence? And uh, is there something that is, uh, as conservationists, you, you are doing to take into cognizance uh, these uh, social realities uh, with us. That, that, that's one. N number two, uh, f from your presentation, again, of course, uh, uh, not very well versed with such a comp that um, uh, conservation uh, is actually a critical uh, intersection. If, if, if I'm wrong. Uh, then I will ask, uh, uh, could you enlighten us a little bit how the conservation, the politics of conservation 
have affected uh, local political hierarchies, uh, particularly in the coast of, 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 of Kenya, uh, and, and how uh, that has interfaced and engaged with uh, the wider uh, political matrix of, uh, of, 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 of the country. Uh, you know, I, I will need some education on that. And, and finally, um, the ethics of conservation. Uh, and, and I'm asking this again as the backdrop. And they released a book uh, entitled uh, The Lie of Conservation, the untold story of wildlife conservation in Kenya. Uh, you, you know, um, ethically, Are we meant to use money in conservation when we have people to feed uh, the prof? Uh, I, I was reading somewhere some time back uh, that uh, expenditure per capita, uh, you know, per capita here, uh, you know, on a lion is higher than probably the expenditure on maintaining Kenneth Mbongi. Uh, that, uh, that the lion is more of more value uh, than Kenneth Mbongi. Uh, and, and when I looked at the figures, probably there could be more. Uh, the amount of money used in uh, taking care of a lion uh, uh, um, uh, in a month is much more than what Kenneth Mbongi earns. Uh, I, I, how do we justify that? Um, uh, uh, you, you, you know, uh, the, 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 monument, uh, the monuments uh, scattered all over the country and, and the amounts that um, uh, you, you know, governments, both county and national are using, uh, how, how do we justify these amounts in an environment that is dominated by extremely uh, poor people? I, I go to Malindi and see that uh, 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 hegemonic towering of Vasco da Gama Pila uh, in an environment that is made up of extremely poor locals and, and, and uh, you see, uh, you know, millions of shillings being spent in making it stand and stable. Uh, justify this. Thank you, sir. Yes, I will react. Yes, Wafura then Kule. Thank you, Professor Home. I also like to welcome you back as my colleague. And my next door neighbor in the department. Uh, thank you very much for that very informative uh, topic which you have given us. Uh, I just wanted uh, you to, to enlighten us a bit on the issue of uh, the impacts of the environment, especially regarding the rise in sea level. In the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, we used to learn that uh, part of the Kenyan coast was in the this south coast that was experiencing rise in sea level, and that the north was not. I don't know if in your Wafura. studies recently. Wafura, yes. just uh, put your mind I don't know if yes, in yes. the studies recently you have noticed uh, whether rise in sea level is throughout the coast or in one side of the coast. And uh, thank you for informing us about, for Jesus, telling us about how it has been affected. But what about other sites, especially on the southern coast? My second comment is about the concept of tragedy of the commons. And as you told us, this concept was uh, popularized by Garrett, uh, Garrett Harding. Uh, this concept uh, is uh, important because it tells us that uh, property that is communally owned tended to be mismanaged. And as you have given us, uh, the picture, 
that seems to be what is happening. But then this concept or theory was criticized by among others, Eleanor Ostrom, who made various studies throughout different parts of the world. He documented many places where communities have cooperated so that instead of seeing negativities, we see positivities in conservation, that uh, local communities are included. And just as uh, our colleague, uh, the uh, departmental chair has commented, local stakeholders, different stakeholders benefit. So uh, did you, do you deliberately use tragedy of the commons to show the negativities of conservation or uh, you or you what i want to say is uh, about communities local people the benefits why should we look at it as a tragedy this whole conservation issue why don't we also look at it in the positive way? How do local people benefit by living in a situation where there's a rampant poverty, the common manage is suffering? Just a, a comment, please, Professor. So, Professor Mohalim uh, Kule, you can take, but let's be a bit fast and brief so that we give uh, the online audience. Uh, so, so chance. Again, thank yes. you. I'll, I'll be very fast and brief. Thank you again, Professor Wahome, for a very enlightening presentation. So I'm going to just go straight to the questions that I have. One is um, the role of county governments, because you have told us that now there is some separation of, sorry, of responsibilities in uh, the management and conservation and, and, and everything else that is related to, to these things. The, the role of county governments vis-a-vis uh, -vis the role of uh, the central government, which in this case, I, I would imagine it would be the mandate of the national museums on behalf of the national government, and how counties have performed since devolution. What, what have they been doing? Uh, can we say that they are making progress, or, or was it a mistake to, do, to, 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 to devolve that function? So that, that's one. <coughs> Uh, the other one, uh, it seems to me that even though the, the Antiquities and Monuments Act of 1983 was, I don't know whether it was reviewed or it was abolished and then it was replaced by, by the act that is now in, in, in place. Then NMK appears to selectively before and continuing to selectively uh, appear to to represent or to prioritize uh, monuments that are colonial in nature. And when it comes to the coast region, I'm talking about Arabic or Islamic colonization along the coast. And when it comes to the interior, European and what appears to be Christian derived colonization. So that at the end of the day, you get to see very little, if anything at all, about indigenous monuments. Uh, being mentioned, being, being found in surveys, just being anywhere. In, in other words, when you look at any map of, of anything monuments, you, you barely get to see anything that is non-colonial, whether you are talking about uh, Islamic or Arabic uh, colonization or European stock Christian uh, colonization. And I was wondering why that is. Is it because maybe the nature and character of indigenous monuments do not get captured in the ICOMOS definition that you gave us of what a monument is. And if that is the case, then is there a need to revise that definition so that the definition can be able to capture indigenous monuments? Okay. Um, and in your view, what is required so that we can actually highlight or even get to know the presence or existence of these indigenous 
monuments. The last one is again uh, on uh, what NMK seems to concentrate on also uh, conservation other than the built environment. Because, uh, for example, in your presentation today, you have given us examples. All of them are examples of the built environment. So, what about others, other areas that are monuments, but they are not actually built environments? Thank you. There's one more, then we will come to another second after the gentleman behind the computer. I saw your hand first. Thank you, Prof, for that very sophisticated kind of presentation. My question is based on what he, you talked about, reinforcement, or in other terms, protecting uh, these kind of monuments that are eroding every day. And maybe my question is about the authenticity, erosion of authenticity. Maybe in other words, that the authenticity is kind of, the, the, the authenticity is going down every day. So I could uh, give, giving an example of Fasco da Gama pillar. I cannot imagine that maybe in 20 years to come, Fasco da Gama pillar looks totally different. And in that case, uh, I wanted to ask Prof, what do you think about maybe reporting of these uh, monuments, maybe historically or archeologically? Madam Tapita, the very last chance so that Professor uh, uh, reacts to those ones, we go to the online audience later, then we'll come back again to another round of questions on those fiscal presence. So be very fast and brief. So uh, thanks, Professor, for this insightful presentation on our heritage. Mine may not be a question per se, but sometimes uh, probably it is like an observation. One is that when you look at, actually you have mentioned tourism as one of the causes or, uh, or probably as a threat to our protected areas that is monuments in our, in, 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 in our, uh, in our coastal areas. And probably I can mention that you find that the government or the government of the day has been, has been fighting hard to be able to revive tourism, but tends to ignore the very pillar that tourism rests on, and that is our cultural heritage uh, in form of uh, the monuments. But you find that when we have tourism visiting our, our coastal regions, we have what we call the uncontrolled, uncontrolled tourism numbers, where you find that this problem becomes more, more, more advanced, especially when you look at the staffing in our museums, the staffs are so minimal to a point whereby they are not able to control the, 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 the tourist uh, numbers when they visit these protected areas. And that is why you find we have so many cases of graffiti, these are the engravings that uh, uh, visitors write on walls, as well as stepping on, uh, stepping on the ruins. Like, uh, when you look at probably at uh, uh, get the museum or they get the ruins as well as Lubara Mutuana ruins. These ruins have become rubbles of a time as a result of uh, uh, tourist, uh, tourist uh, activities. And therefore probably I thought that maybe uncontrolled tourism activities can also be mentioned. The other, the other, uh, uh, the other observation, I don't know if it's an observation or probably it, it may end up coming up as a question, is that we have been able to observe that we have uh, extreme uh, dilapidation uh, cases of our heritage, not only at the Kenyan coast, but probably all over the country. But you find that we have the, what we call the National Museums Act, the 2006, that is on board. And this is a legal framework that uh, it, it's, it's supposed to look at the archaeological heritage management in our country. But you find that the cases are on the increase every day. My question is, why do we have these cases becoming so, so many, yet we have this act on board? Does it maybe imply that the National Museums of Kenya has no legal backing on, or, or, or to be able to, to enforce these laws so that maybe for the community that accommodates this, uh, this heritage, uh, uh, this monument or who live within these monuments, 
are prevented from encroaching, maybe the penalty, can the penalty probably be increased such that maybe they may keep up from maybe uh, causing more havoc to these protected areas? Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, I think, Professor, you can react to those uh, questions, then we go to the online audience. And I'm happy that there has been uh, uh, this thing has come. Sorry, um, my, my gadget had kind of come off. Uh, now, um, I'm happy that there is a lot of reaction to this. And uh, I think uh, I, I'm very happy that uh, there is a lot of interest in this area. Uh, I want to start with the question that was raised by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ken Obongi. And that is about uh, social uh, changing um, uh, issues of roads in South Africa and uh, other issues that are challenging those um, monuments. I think we'll also get there with the time. But the problem here is uh, most of those monuments have lived over time up to the present with the same communities. Like if you look at uh, Old Town, uh, Old Town uh, Lamu, it is the continuously the same population probably since 14th century. If you look at the monuments that we are talking about in Shanga, those were local populations. That is one of the areas that was never colonized. So we had the local populations continuing up to the present. There is one monument called Siu Fort. Siu Fort looks like Fort Jesus and it was built by the local community. So those areas that I'm talking about would be, um, would be uh, uh, from that particular community and there would be no problem. Uh, probably the one, uh, and, and the others are concerned about Islamic, Islam. Uh, Islam and therefore those ones would also, um, particularly scholarship, Islamic scholarship and so on. And those would uh, augur well with the communities there. Uh, but if you look at Fasco da Gama, it represents the entry of Christianity, but it is also European. Uh, those ideas have come with time. There was a consideration of removing for, for, for Fasco da Gama completely. But then you look at the definition of a national monument. A national monument does not exclude like other monuments. Anything within Kenya has been treated as a national monument because it was either built by, uh, by foreigners through Roko people. The Roko people have interacted with it over time and therefore it has been nationalized to that level. Uh, if you look at uh, the Maslui building that I talked about, Maslui is part of the local community. And therefore, there would be no need of uh, the, even the argument about slave trade. He was part of that, uh, that, that family was part of that. So um, I, it, it would be interesting if that angle of roads must go comes in. But for now, uh, our policies, our legal structures um, uh, for any monument that is within the country being part of this country because of that aspect of interaction with communities over a long period of time. Um, then the other issue you talked about is ethics of conservation that people are hungry and uh, people are going on and uh, conserving buildings. I think there's a tragedy that we have to live with. It's like constructing the railway when people are hungry or constructing a road when people are hungry. Um, I think, I think the, the worst that can happen with you when you are, when you are working in the museum is one, one morning to wake up and find that for Jesus has gone to the sea. You are the custodian at that particular moment. If rules change, we work with the rules. But the current rule is monuments are our national monument. Uh, sorry, mon monuments are part of our national heritage. And it is captured in the constitution. Um, as part of our national uh, heritage. 
and it is captured and put under national government. I think I'll be answering Pure when I say that. Uh, the current the Constitution 2010 states very clearly that monuments will be managed by the government and museums will be managed by the county government. The problem has been we have had so many meetings and it has never been uh, possible to detach the county, the, to, to have the counties run the museums. Uh, that has been a problem. We started with Kisumu and uh, by the end of the discussion, the Kisumu County had already taken a monument, which is supposed to be our responsibility. So they have taken Kit, Kit, Kitmikai and uh, it is being managed by the local communities. But the local community there is the one managing Kitmikai. And uh, that is the, uh, the kind of system that we want to adopt for, uh, for the monument so that the communities are concerned. If they don't want it, then uh, they will make that decision. But it would be very important for Shanga that I mentioned in Pate Island. Shanga has a multiplicity of issues. Uh, that poverty is there. But at the same time, there is this, uh, this uh, um, lapset that is coming. Shanga will be the office, will have the offices of the port. And they have already finished, uh, finished the first bath and they are 32. So you can imagine the kind of population. And that is why in this report, we are requesting and we have talked to the county government that they be, give, they be given a museum because most of it, their heritage is taken to Mombasa and, and, and Lamu. But they are still, that, that island is twice as big as Lamu. And that is a very big island, but it has been affected more by terrorism than any other island because it is neighboring Somalia to a certain point. And its trade activities include uh, Somalia and other places. Um, so I'm saying that uh, those are indigenous forms of heritage in that the communities have been involved in them. Um, if you look at Fort Jesus, at one point it was being owned by the Omani Arabs. It is now being used as a community asset. It is, uh, Mobasa cultural festivals are, are, are performed in Fort Jesus um, and, and so on. Uh, I don't know whether I've exhausted your cases. Yes. Um, uh, so the, the issue here is that uh, I've seen more of tendency towards conservation, interest in conservation for the local community the places we have been, local communities. I've, I've interviewed the communities in those, all those areas, and there has been a lot of interest in conservation. And they are the same ones who are looking, who are asking to be given a museum where they can put their heritage. Um, uh, as far as the politicians are concerned, I know now like Lamu, the current uh, Timami, Isa Timami was one, we worked with him at one point on conservation. And he has the, is the one who has saved Lamu in terms of conservation over the years. So in terms of politics, the politicians, even to become a politician, this is one of the issue, promoting heritage uh, for tourism. And the tourism benefits the local people. The people who go to Mombasa usually, usually go for the beach. But they also go for Fort Jesus as an attraction, not a motivation, not necessarily a motivation. So the outcome of this is that they also benefit from the tourism that comes around. And so the politics would be favorable, at least in the area that I talked about. It may not be the case elsewhere. And I don't want to talk about the other places. Okay. Uh, the tragedy of the commons was particularly important for this study. That's why it was used here. Because the issues I was dealing with are about how the commons are either neglected uh, or are going through challenges uh, without being noticed because there is very little attention to facilities 
that are supposed to be shared by many people, okay? So that is the main, problem, the main issue, that nobody takes care of what is happening. Are we together? And sometimes it ends up being um, that they are, they are actually involved in the removing of some of the materials from the site. Are we together? But commons here is materials, not people. That's what it means. So with that, uh, that, that is why I use the tragedy of the commons. County government role. I have answered that question clearly about the county government and its role in all this. And I've said that uh, what we are trying to do if I go into details, and I think I might not be on my side, is to separate so that um, the national museums, as it is, plays the role of the government. The county governments take over the museums and then the monuments fall under the national, the, the, the headquarters, that is Nairobi Museum, takes over the monuments. And this has been discussed up to a very advanced stage with, with, without much success. Uh, that is something that we are still, Karega, Karega Mutahi, Professor Karega Mutahi was the last, yes, not Munene Mutahi, uh, the government representative, was the last person to try to intervene so that we can have some agreement with the, with the county government. I actually think that it would be nice if the county government were to take the monuments as well, because they are within those counties. But you see now, this has already come out in the constitution. There is implementation which we have not been able because of lagging that everybody uh, feels that uh, this should be this way, this should be there, this way. So it has not been implemented, but eventually all museums in this country will be run by the county government. And I'm very happy with that. But some of the monuments should have gone to the county, uh, the, the, the counties. Uh, uh, is it the local government? Then there is a tourism at Kula, you had more. I think I've skipped one. Oh, sorry, ethics of conservation, impacts of environment, uh, rise of sea level. I think rise of sea level has been there from 1900s. We have seen from the industrial revolution. I think that is the argument. But the problem is, it is not something that you see on a daily basis. So it has taken place con continually. But we are realizing because of some of the things that are happening to our monuments today. That's what I can say. It has been there, but it looks like it has, uh, it has caught us, caught up with us. It may not have been as significant in Kenya as it was in other parts of the world. If you remember in uh, 2012, no, 20, 2008, the president of the Maldives, um, when he was fighting for presidency, uh, promised people that would buy another island so that when the big one comes, that was 2008, when the big flood comes and the whole island sinks into the ocean, they will have somewhere to go. I think it was to be bought somewhere in the south, uh, South Africa or Zimbabwe, somewhere. But he never succeeded. So in 2012, he resigned. So you can see those problems were there. It was called Muhammad. So those problems have been, Mohammed Nasheed, those problems will have been there with us. It's only now they are cashing up with us that a whole monument loses the coast, the, the coastal wall to flat, to, to sea, uh, sea reefs and uh, flooding. Then Dilapi did, the, sorry, Tabitha talked about uh, tourism as a threat. Yes, it is a threat to a certain extent but tourism is also, also has its own advantages. So it is about balancing. I agree with you, Tabitha. I also agree with you that uh, there has been a dilapidation, but I think uh, there is also the issue. I think the constitution, whoever designed the constitution had in mind the extent of the museum, that the museum manages heritage throughout the country. I think, and if I, go to, if I go by other countries, and I'm also thinking of like Germany, 
the county governments manage, also manage. So I think that was the, the wisdom that came into it so that museums uh, do not manage everything. I think with that, I think I have tried to answer most of the questions, I'm sure. Thank you, Ben. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for reacting to those questions. I want to believe that uh, the ones who post the questions are uh, satisfied. Uh, we'll come to you, Osaji, just in a moment. We want to shift gear and uh, welcome our online audience. If you have a question, you can uh, raise your hand so that uh, Professor answers it. Anyone from the online audience who has a question, a reaction, comment? Anyone there? Do we have anyone with a question? How, how do you, yes, how do you raise your hand? I can't sit, but I can't speak. Sit, proceed. proceed, proceed. I, I proceed. Now. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Go, ahead. go ahead. My name is, my name is Mugwema Jogona from uh, JK Uart. You can hear me? Uh, mine is more of uh, a comment uh, tied down to a question. Perhaps we can get uh, uh, some ways in which we can be able to continuously increase the complement of uh, monuments in the country. Because as it is now, the pace at which uh, uh, items, whether they are uh, tangible or intangible, get listed for conservation appears to be rather low. And uh, it therefore looks like what, what we consider to be heritage is frozen in terms of quantity. So perhaps, uh, uh, so the point here is that there is a need to have this, uh, this complement continuously increased. The other matter is uh, that is related to climate change uh, is the issue of uh, resilience, resilience especially for urban, urban uh, monuments or, or, uh, or, or urban neighborhoods that, that are conserved or may become conserved in, in, uh, in the future. So if you get a lot of flooding, you get things like fires, you get this and that, um, how, how are these neighborhoods? We need a lot of work to be able to ensure that these uh, neighborhoods get spring back to life because that's the, that's the idea of resilience which is a very big uh, challenge in, uh, in conservation. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for an extremely stimulating presentation. Uh, very much uh, appreciated. Asante. Uh, That's all. Prof, uh, it was more of a comment. Any other person I can see there is a Katura domain. And then- Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Is, mine is just a, a compliment and just an addition uh, about the issue and the, uh, the issue of environment and the, the sea rising. It's just to clarify like the, why the sea is rising because what we are having in our environment currently, the climate change, where you find once the Mount Kenya and the other uh, capped, uh, mountains usually melt. Uh, the water is just going to the sea ends, resulting to this uh, rise in the in the in the sea water, and simply because the temperatures are no longer going down to condense even what has evaporated, and also because of the high temperature, you usually find it's just like you are boiling that water in the sea. The as you boil water, it expands, and that's why I find like a, a, a way of trying to conserve that erosion of the coastal lines and also the water getting where it never used to get. I think it's surely a, a kind of community consorted effort with the, also the need of the county government to realize those areas properly which they have not been built the, the sea walls. Because most of the beaches, they have built the sea walls. We sometimes, if the, the storm water comes with a lot of strength, it is, it's the sea water, the, 
the sea wall and goes back. So those areas where the sea walls are not there, I think it's high time the county government and the community usually come together and either build the uh, sea walls so that at least they will be it will be checking the the water from just going where the water is not intended to go so that it eats the sea wall and goes back. So it's all about the rising in the sea water is because of the climate change, uh, melting of the ices which are no longer cooling back. So you find the, the our water in glacier is decreasing going to the sea and also the high temperatures causing the water to be warm and to expand. That was just my additional contribution on that question on environment and the sea water rising. Thank you. Comment also. Pamela uh, Ngesa. Um, uh, uh, Katula, I think, has uh, said a lot of what I wanted to say, but I want to thank Professor for that uh, very incisive presentation. And um, what I wanted to say, which I think Katula has kind of tried to answer um, uh, partly, is we, we seem to have a government or governments that wait for too long um, before they um, check on the nature of our, um, uh, what we call them, on the nature of our monuments. I, I visited Vasco da Gama in the 90s and it was already just about to collapse. I'm surprised that professor is saying that uh, it's only the other day when now the government tried to stabilize the thing. And so I'm thinking that uh, maybe in the recommendations, uh, we could also try and think of why can't we have a government that is proactive rather than reactive? We have um, enough um, manpower in this country, people who know what is happening. Like, Again, like Atula has, has, has made it very clear, we know what is happening. And therefore it's up to the government to constantly check on this monument so that uh, the, 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 the repairs, if you allow me, um, should not come just when the, the, the monuments are about to collapse, when they are again to be stabilized. Uh, so mine is basically a comment. I'm not asking a question. Uh, is there anyone before we go to the chat box? So that you see where there are uh, comments here and there. Uh, chat box. Anything on the chat box? Are you able to open? Yeah, from, uh, there are quite a number of com comments here. Uh, okay, from Charles Karani to everyone, uh, the presentation is howesome. However, what is the benefit of local community from the monuments that they may act as motivation, leverage for conservation? Uh, then there's another comment from Wima and Chiguna. Comment, uh, it's necessary to continuously increase complement of monuments in Kenya so that heritage is not frozen in time and also deal with the issues, issue of resilience for urban heritage. Um, we may have mentioned this area uh, when he talked another. So basically those are uh, the comments from the chat box. Is there anyone online who wants to ask a question before we move to, to the last round of questions from the on-site audience? All right, it appears like uh, there is no question coming from. Uh, all right, there is a uh, domain. You want to ask a question again? Okay, not really a question, eh? but there was that comment about the, the role of these monuments for the community. You, you see, apart from being tourism and attracting economy for the for the people, I, well, like for last weekend, I just happened to have gone to Gong Hills. And you could see the way the Maasai are targeting people visiting the Gong Hills to sell their ornaments. So where we have these monuments, I think it's surely an effort to, to be made an effort for the local community to come up with those cultural 
uh, cultural things in the, whatever the monument is so that they can be going there with them and then we we create like like the way we talk of special economic zones it becomes an economic zone for that community where they can just go with their artifacts with their cultural things and people visiting are able to buy from them through that you find we'll have that kind of partnership and relationship between the monuments and also the community and they will start seeing the advantages why they should be even part and parcel of conserving their monuments and why they should also with that a lot of attraction will be there even for local tourism to go there and since they know when they go there there are those people who are, who, who are also benefiting apart from socially but also economically yeah just an addition on that very much for your comment and now we can shift it to the uh online yeah yeah Okay, perhaps you note somewhere, then you make your final contribution. Yeah, because we have like 10 minutes. Yes, uh, Dr. Mumia Osach. Dr. Mumia Osach. Uh, from the Department of Literature. Thank you very much for attending to our seminar. Be brief and precise. The point. Thank you very much, Professor Wahome, for that informative presentation. Um, I would want to request you to possibly expand the scope of those monuments that you've uh, studied, perhaps to include uh, what I can loosely call contemporary monuments. I have in mind, for instance, um, contemporary historical figures, some of whom may still be alive, others who may have passed on uh, in the recent past. Um, if I give, for example, an analogy to the developed world, um, the Western world has conserved uh, the buildings where, for instance, Shakespeare uh, lived. Uh, Jane Austen. Um, we have uh, um, writers from France like Moliere, uh, Balzac. In Russia, we have the great Tolstoy. We have Pushkin. Um, you can visit their houses uh, where they used to write, and they have been conserved as uh, monuments. If you come to Kenya, um, we have our own heroes around who may not necessarily be writers, but in their own right, uh, they have contributed to the development of this country in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, from our own department, we have Ngugio Thiongo. He built a very unique structure in um, uh, Kamiritu. Uh, although it's still his home, but is there a way in which such structures can be included in that uh, definition of monuments. If I go to Western Kenya, for instance, uh, we have Elijah Lidonde, uh, who comes from my village, a great footballer. Uh, his house is still there. He passed on around 1987. We had a writer called As Hasalaje Adam Hadambi. Uh, he comes from uh, the neighboring county of Vihiga. Uh, and the list goes on in Mombasa, the Mazrui family, but specifically Professor Ali Mazrui and uh, his brother Alamin. Uh, they have structures which can attract uh, the definition of monuments. There is a musician called um, Naman, Professor Naman. He was, I think, the pioneer reggae musician in this country. Uh, he comes from that area in the coast. Uh, he had a structure. Uh, and so on. The list will be several, perhaps hundreds or thousands of such. But I have a feeling that in um, your report, you could come up with a session or paper that can inform policy. And then possibly the Museums Act can be amended to include these contemporary structures in the definition of monuments. So they are protected, safeguarded, and uh, mainstreamed within our. Um, uh, historical monuments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Osachi. We'll take 
two more, but uh, I request that I also be given a chance to ask uh, one question. I don't want to say that I'm abusing the authority I've been given. I want to request anyone with a question uh, before I ask mine. Yes, Madam Tapita. We have only like 10 minutes. Actually, we are moving uh, beyond the time allocated to us. So that, uh, the very last chance to react, then we close. Okay, okay, thank you. Mine is actually not a question, but, but I wanted to add on uh, what the, our chair of the department had asked about the importance of this monument. This fee maybe why should we uh, use more, more resources to, to conserve these monuments? These monuments, we see them as research centers where people are able to do their studies. And again, this is where, or there are places where where we document our cultural and, and our local values and our cultural and, and, and local values, they're able to bring people together. And in so doing, we, we see them to be very, very important. They are of essence and they need to be protected. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Tapita. I would like now to, I thought that uh, senior uh, Dr. Gona would ask a question because he comes from the coast. Maybe you ask after me. <laughs> I just want to ask a professor, my teacher, you know, mentor, supervisor, all the years from undergraduate up to where I am. I need to thank you very much, Prof. But uh, I know you are a household uh, name when it comes to heritage conservation. I want to ask really, a, I want to ask a question or perhaps just make a comment. You have given us a background on. Uh, you know, the evolution of the term uh, tragedy of the commons, uh, which, uh, you know, was first uh, used by William Foster Lloyd in 1833. Later on in 1968, uh, uh, another scholar came up and tried to, you know, reshape that uh, definition uh, called Garriott Hardin in 1968. That's like a century after. But for him, uh, you know, initially, when uh, we are looking at what uh, Foster said, he was referring to what was happening in Britain, uh, you know, grazing in common lands, and regulated grazing. And therefore, later now, it is used in environmental conservation by Garden, 1968. And all this comes with, uh, you know, unregulated access, unregulated use, and planned, uh, you know, activities and all that. So I was asking myself, why then wouldn't you perhaps adopt uh, uh, Gardin's, you know, uh, statement? You know, for him, he comes up with a statement and he says now it is not even tragedy of the commons. It is tragedy, I mean, a tragedy of the unmanaged commons. Because what, I mean, the problem we are facing is uh, mismanagement uh, of some of these, uh, you know, uh, monuments you are talking about. There is no proper management. There is no uh, proper regulations that have been put in place. So do you think that uh, Hardin was right to change that terminology for a statement and uh, call it or say, uh, do it as a you know, tragedy of the unmanaged commons? Thank you very much, Prof. You are now welcome to finish up completely. Then we we'll ask the head of the department to come and uh, uh, crown off, you know, this meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we, uh, there are a number of comments that have been made and I do appreciate them. Uh, from Mugwema, from Gatula, from uh, uh, Pamela. And I agree with you. I also agree with Dr. Osagi because uh, I think, um, yes, there is a heroes, uh, there, is, there has been a commission that it was dealing with heroes and heroines. And uh, a, a, an area is set for heroes and heroines in Kenya. Uh, I was dealing, since I was dealing with that other bit, um, I didn't talk about those specifically. And uh, oftentimes uh, you'll find that they are very well conserved. I was thinking of the ones that are on the verge of the challenges that I had in mind about the environment, 
uh, particularly global fluctuations, population fluctuations. Those are the things that I looked at. And most of the ones that we call heroes are not exposed to that. I mentioned the uh, Tomboya. I, I talked about the Tomboya's monument, which is in the center of the city. But I think we need to do more in that area. So I agree with you. Uh, we need to do more. Um, uh, Tabitha has also made a comment. Um, I think there were many uh, issues that were raised, but they were all comments. And also Mugwim about listing of heritage is very slow, frozen. I think you use the term frozen. I think uh, we, we, do, we do something like, uh, we gazette all monuments. That's the first stage. Listing is a secondary stage and is done by, by, by UNESCO. And this listing considers certain universal values that must be inherent in a particular object for it to qualify. I think those are the two stages. But the first stage of um, gazettement, uh, we can do at any time, depending on either scientific uh, considerations, that is the scientists declare that this has, this has these particular qualities, or the communities declares, and then it is, it is worked with the community and, the, and the, the heritage expert, so that they present it to NMK and we are able to, to gazette them. So gazettement, I don't think you are talking about gazettement because gazettement is very timely. And we have done most of those types of heritage uh, through gazettement. It's probably listing, which takes a very long time. I know for Mombasa Old Town, it was applied in 1998 but it has not been. And I think the other considerations for living town, uh, there may be very many changes that are taking place. So it must be considered from that light. And that is why we were given for Lamu and not Mobasa, old town. So I think the other considerations that we have been given a list of 10 considerations of universal value. Universal value is, it's the value that anybody from any part of the world can gain by coming to that particular site. So that is the basis for Fort Jesus, the basis for, for Miji, Miji, uh, Mijiken, the Kaya forests, the basis for um, the old town Lamu. Oh, those, those, those may be slightly different, but we can discuss more. Then uh, um, I think I totally agree with the others. Uh, Tabitha, I also agree with you that uh, there are research centers, and that is why they have been taken by the government and not the county government, because as, as that, uh, monuments as research. And I think we are coming up with a heritage bill. There is a heritage bill in parliament, and that heritage bill will be very important for the future of monuments and heritage at large. It is, I think it has gone through Senate uh, for the first time. Uh, there are a number of readings before it becomes an act. Uh, and that will clearly separate and give certain mandates that will enable uh, control of vandalism, for example, some of those issues. Um, uh, there are laws about federalizing uh, heritage. You go, you, you pay one million if you are caught and go in for six months. That is how how serious it is that uh, people still do it because those um, heritages that are sometimes not in the open. And I think I agree with you, Ben, and I mentioned this name, Hadin. I, I mentioned Hadin because I knew Hadin had given a more historical perspective, but this mismanagement, the other sites, there are so many sites that are not managed at all. There are many sites that are not managed at all because of their stability. Like for example, uh, Tomboya here, there's no management going on. So I think the term, when I use the term, um, the, the commons, I was using it first because of the fact that it's a common property. Actually monuments are common because anyone can walk in there and, and see it, anyone. 
The other problem is they are not managed like an, like an office. They are managed probably by only one person or two people. The reason being we have so many monuments in this country. We depend sometimes on the community and that is what we are working on. I mentioned that one of the ways forward is to have the community with us in terms of management. That's why we talked to the community in this particular study, because we wanted to get their feel about those particular monuments. And our understanding is that the communities want those monuments. They also want to benefit from the monuments. And that is what we are working on. And those are the recommendations that I'm giving to NMK. So, and I'm, I'm very happy that the person managing some of the monuments that we are talking about is uh, uh, Isa Timami, as I said again. Now there is another development that is very important. Uh, monuments as part of heritage was being managed together with the sports in the past. But now the current ministry, I hope it will be very effective, is managing tourism, heritage, and culture. That is a very big development. No, it's, it's tourism, heritage, and culture. That is the, 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 the way it is framed. So our parent ministry will be dealing with tourism because they will then be divided into departments. There will be a department of tourism, a department of culture, and a, a department of heritage. Heritage is not limited to monuments. It also includes everything we have inherited from the past generations, even what uh, Dr. Osagi is talking about. So um, I'm happy with the, that change because uh, it's, it's a brighter future for monuments and for heritage and for culture in general. Thank you very much. I do appreciate. I have received so many questions I may not even have answered all but I'm happy that uh, the debate has started. And when you see them, you know they are very important to us. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Of, uh, perhaps you will pick your computer later. Yeah. Colleagues, thank you very much. I want to welcome the head of the department uh, to make a comment. Thereafter, invite, uh, invite uh, Mwari Mukule to give a photo of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nyanchoga. Mine is quick. Um, uh, maybe uh, Professor Wahome and my colleagues, uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is um, uh, the ways in which um, uh, uh, what I loosely see as uh, uh, hegemonic nationalism has led to selective uh, conservation of monuments. And, and, and uh, I'm having in mind um, the, the way the post-colonial uh, Kenyan government seems to not to pay much attention to those monuments, but they speak loudly of the Asian or Indian history. And, and I have in mind, for example, uh, the bringing down of uh, the Desai Hall uh, in, in, in Tomboya Street uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, which was a very important monument, actually named after Al Desai, the man who worked very closely with Hari Tuku, uh, the man whose road that passes near the university is named and will glorify in our history. The second one is uh, the house of uh, just by uh, by Desai, uh, which uh, actually went on auction this week, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, J.M. Desai is a part of the group that joined uh, many uh, leaders of Central Kenya to raise money to send Kenyatta to England uh, to go and uh, purportedly speak for the rights of, uh, of the Africans. Uh, and, and that house uh, uh, was auctioned. Uh, the government went to court belatedly to prevent the auction. Uh, when they needed to have accepted that uh, very early, uh, to, to protect it. So that, that's a question we need to grapple with. Uh, African nationalism uh, really uh, dealing a blow to a, a very important segment of what is uh, Kenyan history, and that is the history of the Indians in, 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 in Kenya. Uh, this is a debate we can continue for the next uh, several hours, and I don't want to get there. 
Uh, but mine is uh, to remind you of uh, our upcoming conference uh, on uh, uh, Mau Mau. Uh, we are uh, at a um, very advanced stage of organizing the program and uh, uh, listing invitations. Uh, so please uh, keep uh, spreading the word among our peers, colleagues and friends uh, that uh, we are having this three day conference beginning on the 17th of this month, 18th through the 19th. Uh, that is the Masjade Eve, and uh, we welcome everybody uh, to, to attend, and the conference is going to be in this room, uh, along with the exhibitions that we are going to have in the space outside uh, uh, this room. Thank you, and, and welcome. Uh, uh, David? I know people are tired going to be very brief, but I must also do what I was requested to do. The first thing is to thank you, everyone, those who are able to find time and join us physically, colleagues, friends, visitors, those who are also able to find time and join us virtually. Asanteli Sana for doing that. First to talk, uh, once more, welcome back to the department. And, uh, we look forward to a lot of things. If I can be able to make just one comment, or maybe two, about I think what, what uh, comes out is there is a challenge out there. It could be a challenge between county governments, national governments, or who does what, or who is failing to do what. Those are things that need to be addressed. We have conflicts, especially at the coast, which is ethnic-based about the conservation. Uh, just before Corona, we were hosting uh, an exchange group with the uh, Yama from I can't remember what university it is. And one of the things that uh, these these students are supposed to do is to go out there. When they came back to Nairobi, they said they were so disappointed when they went to Boy Jesus Museum and also the fort at uh, Rabai. At the fort. That is for Jesus, which is an MK facility, because they were supposed to write that. But they said the only thing that they saw, which is indigenous, which is non arabic that is, was the last desk at the corner at the ghetto. And of course, when you start with that, because it is like a walking expert, you start with the Portuguese. It's like they, before that, there's something, there's one stand, there's something, and then there's the sunken ship that was dug by our brought up by Richard Wald, and then everything else there is about, you know, like Arabs, Omanis, Mazurus, whatever. And only the last desk is when we have something being mentioned about the so That's a very big challenge because why would you want to go to a museum in Kenya which doesn't look like it is in Kenya and there's nothing Ken indigenous represented? And, and I know it is a big argument because there are all these fights, especially in Lamu. When you have the governor having also been one of the pioneers of conservation Lamu style. And so, so these are issues that want to maybe get to be looked at. We have value of monuments. Why, are, why is it that people are not interested in this? Can we create value? Can we, can we find ways in which we can make people decide, I want to go into this because it is good business? At the end of the day, how can we transform monuments, conservation into jobs? employment and work without compromising on the conservation and the conservation aspects. So with those two remarks, Prof, we, we look forward to maybe further discussion on this from different perspectives. And once again, Asante Nisana for coming and uh, we hope to see you uh, Thursday next week for a similar thing, same place, same time. Thank you very much. <laughs>